So now imagine those of you who are older than 40, who worked very hard your whole life, waking up tomorrow, and uh, there is some different flag above uh, the Capitol building. You don't know what the name of the country is. They tell you, you, know, you now live in a new country. All your savings are lost, disappeared. It's not enough to buy a pair of shoes. I mean, imagine, you know, if you worked hard and you saved some money for retirement. Not enough to do any, I mean, it's disappeared. Your beloved daughter, who was su such a wonderful artist and uh, writer and so on and so forth, says, well, mom, you know, I want to be a hot currency prostitute because I don't want to live your life. I don't want to wear these horrible shoes. I don't want to count every topic. I don't want to talk about morals and principles and live in poverty. And your beloved son, who was a champion in uh, figure skating and excellent student, is becoming a gangster. And that's your life. And there's no country. So how did people survive? Why there were no wars in the 90s? This is the question. And again, the answer is tradition. You know, there was the tradition of interpersonal connection, which was violated. You know, society was those of you who traveled to Russia or lived in Russia in the 90s. You know, it, it is horrific. You know, my mother who survived the siege of Leningrad, you know, I showed her, uh, f um, you know, a photo album of a great Russian photography artist. And, you know, she started to cry. I never saw her cry. You know, she looked at it and she, she was crying because she said, she who lived in an orphanage, she said, we had nothing like this ever, ever during that uh, horrible war, you know, in, in orphanages after the siege of Leningrad. She said, we never had this emaciated children, this uh, faces of, uh, you know, that are absolutely debilitated by circumstances, you know, this drunkenness. And that was the part of the country. Yeltsin's goal was to destroy communism. And this is why he was hailed and celebrated in the West. But along with communists, he destroyed what was the structure, cohesiveness of the society. And so when Putin comes and picks it up, what does he do? He has to bring the country together. And we won't go, you know, we have oligarchs, and if you ask, it will be very interesting. But now we're coming to the main topic of our conversation is why Ukraine, why Georgia, why the Caucasus, uh, Northern Caucasus. Bec Russia uh, was no country. It was not, you know, even like in, uh, I remember it was, I think, 2003 or 2004, we had um, a presentation by Steve Krasner, who was before that professor at Stanford, who then, uh, I guess when Condoleezza Rice went into the government, there was a Stanford group there. And uh, Professor Krasner, at that time, he was the head of policy planning of the State Department. He made a presentation on the priorities and uh, goals of American foreign policy to the audience of academics mostly and uh, you know, people who are business people who work internationally. The word Russia was not mentioned once. In an hour and a half, he did not mention Russia once. The head of policy planning of the State Department talking to a very informed audience about the goals and priorities. So of course he stops and there is the arms and they ask, so what, what, what about Russia? Everybody's asking, what about, I mean, like imagine all these Cold War warriors, they did their careers and right? it's, it's not even mentioned. And he, I mean, it was off the record and he says, you know, it's not, uh, you know, not that it's not our priority, you know, we're not interested in Russia. We are not interested in Russia. Why aren't we? In Russia is weak. Russia is not a threat. Why would we, inter we would be interested in countries around Russia, in democratization process uh, in the countries around Russia? That we're interested in. And if those countries will do well, then Russia would do well. But it's not on our radar screen. So if Russia is not on the radar screen, if it's not something of concern or interest to the United States, Obviously, Russia's requests, please respect our national interest. Please do not expand NATO. Please do not put the anti-missile defense here and there. Please do not do this. Please do not do that. What I heard? No. Why? Why to listen to it? That's the mentality here. Russia is not a threat. What's the point? We'll do what we need to do. Let's go, guys. Let's go, boys. That's our chance. You know, let's, let's, uh, let's do it. And Putin waited. You know, again, with my students, we read his speeches. You know, Putin is one guy, you know, when 
not only has the luxury of sitting in uh, Kremlin as long as he pretty much wants, you know, so something that Western leaders cannot enjoy, but he also, you know, he says things, he means what he says. You know, he really means what he says. In the first few years, he really tried to get engaged. He really tried to say, hey, hello, notice us. Notice us. We want to be with you. You know, this idea that was Gorbachev's idea of common European home. We, go, we want to be with you. You know, Gorbachev made that blunder, you know, that horrible mistake. And people would ask, do you, oh, you really, when I say that, you agree with when Putin said that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the biggest geopolitical catastrophe of that? How can you say that? And, you know, it's not because, Putin didn't say it because he lost uh, the empire. But again, imagine, I always say, turn to yourselves and imagine that you lived in the United States of America once, this great country that, you know, was coming from Pacific to Atlantic country with the Midwest and Manhattan and uh, Oregon and the uh, mythology and the chthonic and mythological and religious and atheistic. And that was your country. And then now you shrunk to an Alabama or even California that is really poorly run, you know, where again, people are miserable. People hate each other. People, you know, it's, it's bad. Wouldn't you miss? your sweet childhood of songs and apple pies and, uh, uh, you know, golden retrievers uh, uh, <laughs> running to that uh, wonderful river or the meadow. Wouldn't you miss that? You know, that sense of living in this extraordinary country? You know, we talked um, here, you know, those of you who travel to the Soviet Union, you know, you go to Moscow, you take Trans-Siberian, you go f far east, you fly to Central Asia, you travel Uzbekistan, uh, uh, Turkmenistan, uh, uh, this Central Asia, then you fly to the Baltics, then you go to Moldova, you drink Moldovan wine, and it's all one country. This is what Putin meant. So, but here he goes to the basics. And Ukraine, why is it not a surprise? Ukraine has always been the red line. Not because he is the usurper, you know, who wants to just march, march, march and take more land. Because that's Russian history. You know, attacks by Mongols and Tatars, that's that mythology. Attacks by Poles, when Moscow was taken twice, Attacks by Napoleon, 1812. Then we have uh, World War II, 25 million people dead. So Russia has, and the Japanese, you know, it has a history, you know, and that's a part of genetic composition. And one of the things that Putin was very firm about when he came to this third term, he said, we are going to do something about uh, history textbooks. Because two years ago, there were 46 versions of history textbooks in Russia. 46 versions with interpretations that were going like all over the place, you know? Because the nation, that's a part of that reconstruction of this uh, mythological way of thinking. But even although that new textbook didn't come into you know, was not published yet, was not used in text. So when we have 80% of support to Putin for Ukraine, for the Crimean campaign, you can see that he managed to press those buttons that had the population respond very, very strongly. Whether he will move further, it will all, he doesn't. So the Russian goals are federalization of Ukraine. And you would, it would seem to you, okay, so why would Russians be telling us what to do? Millions of Russians. When he said in his speech, the Russian is the most divided people. You don't think about it this, this way. But when the Soviet Union disintegrated, so many Russians remained abroad with the sometimes very unfriendly policies towards them. So, you know, Russian world, and it's very interesting, his press sector, secretary at Peskov a couple of times mentioned of Putin as the leader of the Russian world, which is very dangerous because it's very hard to de de define the borders of the Russian world, but yet. So if Russians uh, in Kharkov will be discriminated, and again, we don't know which propaganda would work, be more powerful, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. The biggest issue to look for is Transnistria, 
So again, you know, now when the Russians are saying that it's basically in blockade and uh, Ukrainians are saying no, very important to come in you know, for objective parties and see what is really happening. Because those could be just triggers. It will take 30 minutes for us to destroy ourselves. 30 minutes from a small conventional war to nuclear war. So very, very important to get engaged. So by taking the Crimea back, do you <coughs> see this as the next step, the first step, or the last step in uh, Russia trying to restore uh, Russian boundaries uh, that uh, historically have belonged? Mm -hmm. So I do not believe that Putin has a goal of reclaiming territories. Crimea is, you know, everybody agrees, you know, nobody is, uh, I mean, outside of Russia is happy about the annexation. I mean, it's an annexation. Mm -hmm. Crimea is a special case, okay? But I believe that now by announcing himself as being a leader of the Russian world and by stating very clearly, very clearly in that speech, you know, go find it on Google and listen to it. He basically said, that's it, guys. <laughs> I've been waiting. I've been trying to you know, attract your attention to my issues, to my country's interests, to my national security interests. You've ignored it. So now I'm going to be acting as please, like you have been acting. This is what he said. So if there will be problems in, Tran in Transnistria and Russians would be suffering, he will go in. Wouldn't we? The question is, wouldn't we, if there would be a zone with a compact American population somewhere, and there was a proven record, proven, I'm not, right now we don't have anything proven, you know, it's again a lot of propaganda, record of Americans being abused, and the governments would just not respond. Wouldn't we go and protect uh, the uh, American citizens? I'm not going to answer this question, but is there a limit? So obviously, you know, he, what, by this desperate act, desperate, you know, it wasn't in the cards. Why did Crimea happen? The 21st of February, Putin was watching. The 21st of February, when three ministers of foreign affairs signed with Yanukovych and representatives of the opposition, signed a document that basically said that Yanukovych approves of uh, the early elections, that you know, basically surrenders his authority. So let's just trot to those uh, early elections, and then you can do what you want. And it was signed. And what happened on the 22nd? The opposition took over government buildings, and not one of those foreign ministers remembered of that document, international document. So of course Russians looked at it and said, according to a um, uh, Ukrainian constitution, the president has to be deceased, or has to uh, write an abdication note, or the parliament has to vote for his resignation. None of this happened, so this government is not legal. This government is not, to Russians, again, you know, it, that's what they say. And one of the things, remember when we talked about those layers, a very important thing to understand Russians, and my students know that, there is a difference, there are two notions of truth. It's like creative spelling that uh, one of my kids' teacher was practicing creative spelling. So Russians have two notions of truth. When you listen to Putin's speech or when you watch them do some things, keep it in mind. There is truth that's called pravda, which is a verifiable truth, something you can prove. And there is a truth that's called istina, which is the truth of the heart. And so what Russia is doing now is the truth of the heart. Because they believe that they tried everything else. And so it is impossible to deal on this very different levels of, you know, this course is so different. Is it necessary? Ask me a question. It is. You know who is the main enemy of the United States in the future? God forbid, but the way things evolve, it will be China. The adversary. Let me not use the word enemy. China. So United States with the Arabic world, which we will never get, we will never understand, we will, it's just too complex, too, I mean, you just can't even get in there. You know, I just have such a deep admiration for people who actually try. <laughs> and China, these two cultures will never be our civilizational partners, will 
not. We'll not be looking and say, oh, I really should take American uh, interest into consideration. I really should you know, do that. And Russia still has that potential. Remember those Mongol Tatars? You know, there is this young generation of Russians who are well-educated, sophisticated. Internet is a very new factor. You know, who want to be citizens of the world, but Russian citizens of the world. And this stability break that Putin is holding on to, you know, in a way, he gives an opportunity so that these young people are not perturbed, are not thrown off the cliff again, like they happened in the 90s, when generations were dying of heroin abuse. People were unprepared for that freedom that rolled in. And so Putin now, willingly or unwillingly, we don't know, he gives the space for the young Russians to grow up. So what's the way out? Thousands of Russians coming here to study, thousands of Americans going there. That's the only way we will learn to understand each other. But the long term, we need to remember, the weaker Russia is, the stronger China is. <coughs> And that's not in our national security interest. Yes, well, I'm, Karin. I'm a psychiatrist here, so I'm thinking, what's pride got to do with it? Have you ever been humiliated? Yes, and I think it's really a powerful force. Well, if you have been humiliated once, yeah, I have. you have the scar. If you have been humiliated a hundred times, and publicly, publicly, yeah. go read Strop Talbot's book that's called uh, Russia's Hand. And, you know, when I taught in English, I was always telling my students, because it was in English, read it as a Russian. You know, that public humiliation of that self-imposed destruction, lack of dignity, lack of self-respect. You know, once you turn the tide, you never want to go back. You know, for Russians, again, that's why I talked about mythology. You know, that pride of people persevering despite anything was a very important part of mentality. That all disappeared. And Putin is too pragmatic. You know, Putin was called Russian German, you know, because he's a very, very pragmatic and intelligent leader. I know it's hard to, you don't read about it in the newspapers, but he's actually quite intelligent. And, uh, you know, when time after time after time after time, you can call it pride, you can call it giving up, you can call it choosing a different strategy, and you know, risky. yeah, but time after time after time, and I think in his case, there was pride. How does this pride affect the questions that mm -hmm. those people asked you at the beginning? Emotion does, uh, I mean, the southern uh, Central Asia has never been the difference between Central Asia and Ukraine, of course, you know, that, uh, you know, completely different cultures. You know, Ukrainian, Western Ukrainians are different be because they're ba basically Poles and Catholics. You know, it's a different culture, you know, so, but Eastern Ukraine, you know, and Crimea was Russian, so that, there was a lot of similarities, you know, and it's always been that buffer. You know, Central Asia hasn't been that buffer forever, you know, but with Islam, which is a very, very different religion, uh, and, the, you know, the Tatar Islam in Tatarstan, you know, has not been that darker version of Islam that's on the periphery and that, that underbelly. So, uh, you know, the issue of pride uh, f never affected, uh, you know, they, they, w they were weaker. They were coming to Russia most of the time. So that, that wasn't uh, an issue. My question was, his alignment with uh, Iran and other mm -hmm. places that uh, are Islamic, mm -hmm. and uh, obviously an enemy of Putin mm -hmm. in one sense. Well, Iran, the, what brings us Americans with Russians very close, Russians as much as Americans do not want Iran to have a nuclear weapon. That's the similarity. Iran is a neighbor. Iran has been there forever to Russians. Forever, you know. And uh, so they see it very different. They, you know, they never took Russian embassy and uh, embassy staff hostage. You know, it's a very different relationship. You know, Iran never threatened Russia directly. Chechnya, now, you know, Islamic Jihad has moved to Dagestan. That's when Putin said about this greatest uh, catastrophe of the 20th century that collapsed. Of course, you know, they were enemies. I mean, they were taking, you know, there are uh, terrorist acts that are happening all the time, all the time in Russia. But, uh, you know, there are Muslims, there are lots of Muslims in Russia. He cannot open a jihad against Muslims. And Tatarstan is in the heart of Russia. Now we have ta Crimean Tatars. We have uh, migra migrants from Central Asian Republic. So he has to be very careful with uh, Islam. So again, another historical kind of a streak here. You know, there's always in Russia, and it's Peter the Great beginning there. You know, we had Slavophiles, 
you know, Russian nationalists, where Russia is, you know, the greatest country with unique path, you know, messianic goal, and so on and so forth, and westernizers. So westernizers are those bright, intelligent, not that the other ones are not bright, but just different mindset, you know, who travel to Europe, who love Western values, who want to live in Paris. They want Moscow to be like Paris. Who doesn't? <laughs> or they want St. Petersburg to be like London. Who doesn't? Okay? And it's normal. The question is, are there enough of those people who think that way? Right now, no. The answer is no. Because most of the population still lives in dumpy, 65% of Russian population it lives in small towns, under 100,000 people, okay? Provincial, you can say. And what's the life of the youth? You mature, you date, you go maybe study, maybe you go to the army. You know, they don't think about Putin. You know, I mean, yes, there are political organizations that support Putin, but this is not what is the driving force of modern politics. Of course, you know, internet is very, very important. And nobody knows what would internet do to Russian youth because there is no precedent. You know, what was put into the heads when I was telling you about what was the foundation of society, it was always, the input was always controlled. Monarchy, orthodoxy, peasant community. The values were there, the tradition, so that's what they were receiving from the same books, the same curricula, so on and so forth. Move the Soviet Union, everybody was watching the same movies, everybody was reading the same books, we all could share the discourse, it was common discourse. Now, we don't know, and you would think, oh, that's so interesting. Russia is emerging as a very conservative country. My students know over 70% of Russians in the poll that was taken about a year and a half ago said that it is, listen to this, morally unacceptable to smoke marijuana. Over 70%, morally unacceptable. And you would say, excuse me, well, I mean, why is that? Because for Russians, it doesn't matter whether it's marijuana or heroin. They lost generation of their children to it. They don't want that anymore. Homosexualism, when they say over 70% say that homosexualism is morally unacceptable. If I come there as a lesbian woman, and I have friends, and I say, well, you know, I'm, I happen to be lesbian. Nobody's going to be throwing stones at me. You know what they will do? They will feel sorry for me. They will feel sincerely sorry for me because they will think, and they will not say it, but they will think, well, poor woman. She'll never have children. She'll never have a loving husband. She will never have, her life will not be predictable. How is she going to cope with it? She will be a pariah always. That's what they think. But when we had this whole Sochi thing about propaganda, the gay propaganda among children, they say, you can be whoever you want. Pink, blue, yellow, green, it's your choice, rainbow. But don't touch our children. We survived the 90s, don't impose it on our children. We are afraid to lose them. Not because it's sin, but it's morally unacceptable for you to come to our children with it. That's, uh, that's why it's conservative. And so that's how the country is emerging. And lots of things that, uh, you know, the fascinating data, right? So it's emerging as a very conservative country. I don't know where the youth will come out, you know, because we don't, the input is not controlled. From kind of a behavior point of view, an analysis point of view, it, do you see any um, overlap of the hardships of Russians growing up and Islam moving in? In Russian case, I see uh, the political Islam evolving, uh, but again, not because uh, People are, are poor, you know, Lilia from, is from Tatarstan, so those of you who are interested, she may tell you. But it's because they need a greater cause that, than themselves. You know, they need, people need the greater cause, basically. Remember that value rationale? You know, the, and uh, I don't see poverty pushing people into Islam, or poverty pushing people into Russian Orthodoxy. I don't see that. But what I see, skinheads, I see. You know, political, you know, uh, violent Islam. You know, when they feel, again, uh, uh, where is Karen, you know, that pride or lack of pride or humiliation or not feeling like you're an equal human being, you know. So there's a lot of psychology in broken societies. Mm -hmm. And Russian society is a broken society, but broken society on a mend. And unfortunately, this big uh, 
how you call the sticky thing, Band-Aid is Crimea, <laughs> okay? But, uh, but uh, you know, unfortunately, that's the reality. Again, whether we like it or dislike it, but that's the reality. What yeah, we really want to know, and you can answer people's questions privately, is are we going into the Ukraine in Russia? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, Kissinger the wrote the greatest yeah. piece, you know. I mean, Kissinger actually rose to the occasion, and he said the Ukraine has to be neutral. You know, no NATO in Ukraine, as hard as it is. It has to be federalized because the country is so different, you know, that it can be w like Germany. It can be like a normal country. It will be. It's a very courageous step, you know. It will be very hard. But the people ha have to come and help. And it's not, do, are we going to fight Russia? We all face these two giants, which is one, economy, and the second one, climate, you know, which are very interrelated. These are our common problems. So. For us, you know, who, who study the situation to see where we could, there's unnecessary crisis, this crisis is unnecessary. Mm. You know, remove politics from it, come with economic packages, engage the youth, you know, g take the um, carpet from under the feet of uh, extreme nationalists, you know, give them all something to do. Not not, don't give them weapons. That's not how we're going to resolve it. Don't whip up hatred. Don't whip up resentment or rejection. There's been enough emotions. There's been enough history. You know, let's, we have economy and we have climate. And this is what should unite us all. Thank you Hopefully. Well, thank you, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.